It's the week ending Saturday the 17th of April and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen tributes paid to the Duke of Edinburgh, who's died aged 99, protests in Minneapolis after the shooting of Dante Wright, and former PM David Cameron breaking cover over the Greensill lobbying scandal. But we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And joining me today from the week's digital team, it is our expert on international matters, despite him never leaving his London flat since he started working here, Joe Evans, uh, and two freelance writers for the price of two, Sachandrika Chakrabarti and Tomiwa Oalade. Uh, Sachandrika, you're up first. What do you think this week should be remembered for? It's not just our health that's under threat from COVID. Well, the, the biggest priorities for the leaders of the world is to uh, reverse uh, the policies that have brought us to our knee in 2020. 2020 is the outcome of years of neglect. It is the outcome of policies that had prioritized economic growth, maybe, but did not equally put a focus on the fight against discrimination and inequality and public investment in public health sector. So the first um, priority for the world is to reset and reboot. Amnesty's Secretary General Agnes Kalamar talking to Deutsche Welle. Uh, so Chandrika, we had an idea of what she was on about there, but what's the story? Amnesty's global report for 2020 to 21 is out and it paints a really grim picture of the state of human rights across the world. Um, So we just heard from Agnes Kalamar, who's Amnesty's new secretary general, and she says that COVID-19 has exposed and amplified everything that's wrong with society today. So amplified, because, I mean, let's be honest, when Amnesty published a report of human rights abuses, it never makes happy reading, does it? What, What has been amplified? What's different this time? Yeah, so the report goes into leaders weaponising the pandemic by using it to ramp up attacks on human rights. Vulnerable people and elderly people died in their thousands in care homes. We certainly saw that in the UK. And gender-based and domestic violence has increased in every region of the world. Again, we've seen all these things in the UK. And also the report attacks global bodies such as the International Criminal Court and the UN. And they say they have failed to meet human rights challenges across the world. So they've let governments in Russia and Eastern Europe and Central Asia attack the right to a free trial and other kind of um, rights of free expression. Tom, those global bodies, so we're talking about things like the International Criminal Court or the UN, have they done anything to tackle these kinds of challenges? Well, they've tried to, but I think it's difficult at the moment because one of the problems with the current situation is a restriction in terms of movement. So that's been one of the um, key explanations for why things like domestic violence and abuse has increased over the past um, year or so, is that people can't actually move as easily as they could have previously. So this makes vulnerable people, um, especially women and especially refugees and migrants, more vulnerable to abuse um, and discrimination and oppression. So this means that it makes it all the more difficult for especially international bodies and human rights organisations to help them out. Yes, and that applies to journalists as well, I guess, Joe. I mean, I mentioned in the introduction how, like all of us, you've been working from home. That's part of the issue, isn't it? Journalists used to be on the ground in some of these places to expose this stuff, foreign correspondents, but instead they're having to report on it from afar and, and not know what's going on. Yeah, that's quite right. One of the side effects of the sort of advertising and some of the money falling out of journalism over the past 30 years, really, is that foreign correspondents now are often not posted to foreign places and left there for any length of time. They often are based in London and then are sent to cover various conflicts or various human rights issues as and when. It should also be said that this report also pulls out fake news laws very specifically as something that has been used to clamp down on uh, freedom of expression during the pandemic. The example given is the Singaporean authorities who passed a Protection from Online Falsehoods and Manipulations Act. Now that sounds quite reasonable you would think but actually you know what this is used for is to force media platforms to carry corrections or remove content that the government considers to be false and the penalties for not doing so are 10 years imprisonment or fines of up to £540,000 and obviously what the government deems to be false or incorrect is not necessarily the same as what is false and incorrect and so there is also examples of sort of journalism being weaponized as a means by which to suppress people's ability to express themselves as well. Yeah, I mean, that element of this report's really interesting, isn't it, Sachandrika? Because we may not like all the regimes that have these laws to combat fake news. And as Joe suggests, we may not agree that everything they consider to be fake is actually untrue. 
But at the same time, presumably, I mean, Amnesty aren't going to say this, but presumably those laws are also being used in the ways they were intended to remove phony science, quack stuff, quasi-science, stuff that also threatens people's lives during a pandemic. So it's a mixed story. Yeah, it's a mixed story and it's hard to measure how much good they're doing because if they are taking those sort of stories down from the internet, we won't know because we never read them. But the problem, Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so the problem is is if you give these powers to a government during an emergency like a pandemic, it's how far they'll take those powers. So, for instance, in the Philippines, they've passed an anti-terrorism bill, and it's so broad and so vague because it's trying to cover everything that the definition of terrorism can be used to target rights campaigners. And the Philippines is already it's already one of the most dangerous countries in the world, I think, after Colombia for um, rights campaigners anyway. And so if you're trying to incorporate everything and cover every kind of danger at the moment those laws can be misused is, I guess, the problem. And we've seen that in the UK with the protests against the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, which, again, is very, very large. It covers lots of areas. It covers lots of things around statues, but not much on violence against women and girls, which seems to not be that helpful at the moment. So it could be that these powers are misused under the guise of being a useful law. I mean, do you think it is helpful, Tom, to draw comparisons with the UK? when you're looking at countries like the Philippines and Nigeria and Brazil, where an average of 17 people were killed every day by police in the first half of the year, according to this report. I mean, that isn't happening here. Yeah, so I, I think in countries like the Philippines and in Brazil and in uh, any other countries, um, such as Hungary, where, um, where they have a, a greater history of human rights abuses against journalists and against human rights campaigners, I, I think the problem is, is clearly significantly worse than in the UK and in other Western European countries. And I think that one of the issues is that the um, rollout of vaccine has been less efficient in, in countries like the Philippines. So less than 1% of the population um, in the Philippines has been fully vaccinated compared to a much higher percentage in Western European countries. So countries like the Philippines have that greater excuse to continue with these particular laws and to exploit the use of these laws to further demonise and to further oppress um, human rights campaigners. Yeah, I mean, do you think there are justifications, Joe? You know, if you were running one of these states that's being singled out uh, for criticism in this report, there are justifications for what they're doing during the pandemic. Well, I think there are certainly justifications for lockdown measures. And, you know, we've had our freedoms curtailed here, and I don't think anybody, well, only the most unreasonable MP would argue that that was completely unreasonable. Um, I think the problem is the extent to which excessive violence is being used to police the pandemic in lots of places, as has been mentioned already, the Philippines and Brazil are two of them. Nigeria is another one that Amnesty um, specifically draws on. Kenya is also another place which we've discussed previously, had a very successful pandemic response in 2020, but it did did come with you know excessive use of police brutality and violence in order to make sure that people followed very, very harsh lockdown restrictions. And so I think that, you know, there are perfectly reasonable arguments for the type of shutdowns you've seen, and there's perfectly reasonable arguments for people having their freedoms curtailed in order to protect other people in a pandemic. You know, arguably that's part of living in a society. The problem is that, you know, these countries that are being discussed in this amnesty report are countries that have harassed health workers and other key workers, arresting key workers, dismissing health workers. And I think that's the element of this which is more troubling rather than actually just the existence of lockdown regulations, full stop. And I suppose also, Sachandrika, the point at which some of these uh, adjustments in the ways that governments behave are irreversible. You know, will this be temporary because of the pandemic and, and will they go back to how things were before or have they all tightened down and we're stuck with it? Well, there is a glimmer of hope offered in the report, and that hope is protest. And the report does say that protest has continued despite many governments' attempts, and um, we've seen that in the UK, to cut down on our right of freedom of assembly. So obviously at the moment, the thought of huge crowds protesting does run counter to ideas of how we're going to beat the pandemic. The report does cite the worldwide Black Lives Matter movements, um, the abortion rights protests in Poland, Myanmar's movement against the military rule. These are kind of impressive fightbacks, even at a time when the pandemic has changed how we live and people might be financially um, suffering, suffering in many different ways. But we're still fighting back. Despite what we said about the report honing in on other countries, like the UK comes in for a real battering in this report. So um, Amnesty International's UK director, Kate Allen, points out that on the right to protest, on the Human Rights Act, on accountability for coronavirus de deaths, on asylum, on arms sales on, or on trade with despots, the UK is speeding towards the cliff edge. And um, th there's a lot of criticism of Boris Johnson's government. 
The report also highlights concerns about our immigration and housing systems, police discrimination, the government's crackdown on the right to protest, which the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill is about, and the resumed arms trade with Saudi Arabia. So the UK is not getting away with being a world power that's a model for other countries. We're kind of getting our hands dirty as well. Yes, that's interesting, isn't it, Tom? Because um, I guess people listening to the point I made earlier, you know, would feel almost quite complacent. We're not doing the stuff in Britain that the police are doing in Brazil. But what we are doing, as Sachandrika just said, is we are cutting our international aid budget. We are resuming arms sales to Saudi Arabia. So we are having an impact on the human rights of people in other countries. And I suppose it is arguable the government have used the pandemic to, to cloak that. They wouldn't have got through their cut on international aid were it not for coronavirus. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a very fair point to make. There was obviously a um, massive protest um, famously in Bristol a couple of weeks ago. Um, protesting against the crime legislation that's being debated in Parliament. And th- there are definitely people, cabinet ministers in Boris Johnson's government, like Priti Patel, um, who are more authoritarian when it comes to things like um, criminal justice um, and cracking down on protests. So this the um, lockdown provides the perfect environment or context with which they can push through their authoritarian instincts. And Joe, we heard Amnesty in Sachandrika's clip calling for world leaders to create policies to ensure that this doesn't happen again in the future. You know, a lot gets said about that, doesn't it? Oh, there'll be learnings from events like this. But how optimistic can we be that that these sorts of lessons are learned? We did see a couple of weeks ago world leaders call for a more bilateral approach to pandemic control, for example, which is one of the things that we could see as a way of avoiding having to enact this type of legislation again. I mean, the problem that you have there is a lot of the things that were mentioned in that call were things like sharing vaccines more adequately. And given that we could be doing that right now and aren't, that doesn't seem to be something that's possible. The problem I think you have is that in a lot of the countries that have seen freedoms recede during the pandemic, it does look as if it's here to stay. The, the one that jumps to mind is Hungary, which actually repealed its emergency legislation for dealing with the coronavirus. But as was noted by a lot of analysts at the time, the law still left the government with a lot more power than it had before the crisis. For example, it can now declare a state of health emergency or or nudge parliament aside and rule by decree for as long as it wishes, should it see a situation where it needed to do so. Now, when you have a lead like Orban, that could be basically any threat to power. In those types of countries, I think it's going to be very hard actually to roll back a lot of what has happened. Whether or not there'll be lessons learned in the UK, I think probably does, as frustrating it is, remains to be seen. Um, Whether we get the public inquiry that has been touted into the coronavirus response will probably be a big part of that. And I think that would be some much needed transparency. But given, frankly, how the response has gone to things like PPE scandals, I'm not quite sure that we should get our hopes too high. And so, Chandrika, finally on this, I mean, you've chosen this as your underreported story of the week and that in itself sort of speaks volumes doesn't it it's underreported because i mean generally speaking people have got their minds on other things it feels like too big a thing to take on board at the moment doesn't it and it, it is a really grim report and it if it's such a it's like kind of a downer at the moment we're in right now where things feel really difficult but as i said there are some glimmers of hope and the report is looking to the future and it's saying that it's ordinary people who have got us through this pandemic. So it is the key workers who have kept society running. It's not the rich who have apparently only got richer. And the last time I was on the podcast, we had a story about the US and UK stock markets having historic rises. So exceptional leadership came from like the ordinary people, the nurses and doctors and health workers and so on. And so... You know, the protests as well, Black Lives Matter, the NSARS protests in Nigeria and the virtual climate strikes do point to the fact that people are kind of coming together thanks to the internet and saying we're not going to put up with these things. We're going to try and find a better future and hopefully that spirit will continue. And as Calamar says at the end of the report, the only way out of this mess is through international cooperation. Now, we've said that hasn't hugely happened with the vaccine so far, but maybe once this kind of emergency state has ended and people feel more comfortable going out into the world, maybe this will make people realise that we've got to start doing things together in order to have a more positive future. Uh, Joe, I'm coming to you next after this. OK, Joe, your turn. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Is Russia's Cold War with Ukraine in danger of heating up? At a railway station just south of the city of Voronezh, there's a small military camp. The ground's all cut up. A lot of kits been moved through here recently. It's ended up at this much larger field camp just down the road. It seems to be a pretty big operation that they've got going on here <laughs> and that we've driven right into the middle of. 
The Ukrainian border is about 170 miles southwest. The Russian-backed separatist republics in eastern Ukraine, where there's been a pickup in fighting in recent weeks, are further south still. So it's strange to bring a lot of troops here. Diana Magne reporting from Voronezh in Russia for Sky News last week. Uh, Joe, what's been going on this week? So this is sort of the continuation of a story that's been bubbling away quite quietly in the background for quite some time now. Um, since mid-March, there's been warnings from Ukraine and Western governments that Russia was starting to mass troops, um, both in the Russian annex Crimea and also just around the eastern Ukraine conflict zone where fighting broke out in 2014. How many troops? So according to the Ukrainian presidency, Russia's got about 40,000 troops on the eastern border and about 40,000 in Crimea. People have pointed out that there are a couple of Ukrainian strategies um, that may have provoked the Russian move. The first one is a strategy for deoccupation and reintegration of Crimea, which was, of course, annexed in 2014, um, and also a recently approved military strategy that um, explicitly mentioned Russia as a threat. Um, but essentially what, what has happened this week is that the movement of troops and the massing of troops has really sent the Ukrainian president Zelensky into a really frenetic round of diplomatic activity, um, including calling on NATO to fast track the country's application for membership in order to make him feel slightly safer from, from a Russian attack from the east. OK, well, let's go through each of those things in turn then. I mean, first of all, what are 80,000 troops, Tom, doing, as we heard in that report, over 100 miles away from the border with Ukraine? What, why have Russia said they're there? It, it, it's quite it's quite confusing because many people think the reason why Russia um, is there is because they're trying to protect the interests of Ukrainian people um, that consider themselves Russian, essentially. So in, in the um, Donbass region, which is the conflict zone in eastern Ukraine, there's been a sharp increase in the number of Ukrainian Russian speakers who have recently got Russian passports. Another reason is that the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, has been clamping down on pro-Putin Ukrainian oligarchs. And the president has also banned pro-Russian TV stations in Ukraine as well. But it's not tit for tat, is it? We're talking about 80,000 troops. I mean, there's only so many ways you can interpret that. I mean, there's a, that's a lot of guns. You know, what are they doing there apart from they're about to start a war? Why else would they be there? Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think that that is the most likely outcome is that they are trying to reignite the conflict that um, initially started in 2014 with the um, infamous um, little green men that came in. But 80,000 80, troops doesn't sound um, so little. And also it's psychologically different, isn't it, Sachandrika, to 2015? Uh, because the Russians took the effort then of concealing their involvement, as Tom's suggesting, and denying that it was them or that they had anything to do with the uh, troops that had entered Ukraine. Now they're they put up a big Russian flag. Sky News are there filming it and we're all seeing it and talking about it two weeks before anything's happening. So that's a different technique, isn't it? What's the point? Yeah, it does seem like it's much more showy this time. And also the timing could have a point. So there's been a bit of a standoff with uh, President Joe Biden coming in. And it seems like Putin was kind of testing him because he had a much better relationship with Biden's predecessor. So it seems to be a bit of a show of strength. It's very diplomatically put. Sometimes it can be. <laughs> um, so like, um, yes, it can be a kind of a show of strength. Hello, new American president. What are you going to be like? So Putin has a couple of things that he's facing. It feels to me he's doing the equivalent of riding a horse without a top on, but with 80,000 troops. So he's, um, because that's his main um, way of changing his image. So Putin faces parliamentary elections in September and he's got a continuing mass movement behind his opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. Um, so Navalny's in prison right now. He's on hunger strike. His health is quite bad. And all these stories are coming out and making Putin's government look really bad. So the Kremlin, quote unquote, defending embattled Russians in Ukraine can um, go down well with voters who vote for Putin because they see the kind of military might behind him as opposed to what other countries might term human rights abuses. So, um, if the Kremlin whips up patriotic fervour, that kind of pushes Navalny further down the news agenda and puts Putin in this kind of great light. If he is testing Biden, Joe, then I suppose we should pay a bit more attention to how Biden's responded. What's happened? Yes. So much like most of other Ukraine's allies, actually, Biden has largely just gone with unwavering support and backing Ukraine's government. The issue really here is, is the NATO element, I think, because Zelensky has on Tuesday actually spoke to the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stolenberg, and essentially asked them to speed up their membership of NATO. The, the hope in Kiev is that if they formalise their relationship with NATO, it would deter Russian military intervention because under the treaty it would draw other powerful Western militaries into the dispute 
and that would obviously trigger far bigger conflicts than Russia could potentially fight down on its own. Sources within NATO have said that Ukraine needs to focus more on domestic reforms because it does still have an issue with corruption um, and also develop its defence capabilities in accordance with NATO standards if it's to become a member. Actually, developing defence capabilities, it was a sticking point for Biden's predecessor. You may remember he would often slam NATO allies for not spending enough on military spending. And that's possibly not going to sit hugely well in Kiev if they if they note that link. On the flip side, Moscow has blamed NATO and the US essentially for turning Ukraine into a bit of a powder keg. Um, NATO and the US have been increasing arms supplies to Ukraine and also modernising their military. So I think a lot of this hinges on the relationship between Russia and NATO, Russia and Ukraine, and then obviously also Ukraine and NATO. And, and where that plays out, I think, will be quite interesting and, and will likely dictate the next few weeks and months of this, well, cold conflict for now. I mean, in terms of the US, Tom, I've seen some of the reports about uh, Biden deciding to withdraw all the troops from Afghanistan by September the 11th, contextualising that as a shift away from uh, the Middle East and towards Russia and China. But, you know, it, I imagined it more as a slow pivot. I wonder if Americans are really ready to say, right, we're not doing the Middle East anymore. Let's go, boys. <laughs> Possibly. But the thing Biden has done recently is he has tried to de-escalate the um, conflict. So he's actually called for um, a presidential summit, which includes both Ukraine and Russia as well. That's contrary to the perception that, that Biden is more hawkish on, on, on this situation than Trump was. The immediate response from the Biden administration has been trying to um, dis- de-escalate the conflict. And that's also been the um, immediate response of NATO as well. I, I don't think anyone from the West, NATO or Biden, is um, ready at this moment to engage in a quote-unquote hot war with Russia um, at the moment on behalf of Ukraine. And that links into Chandrika, doesn't it, to your story from the top of the show? I mean, one of the reasons that the G7 countries, Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan and the US, will issue statements saying they're deeply concerned is they don't want to actually have to do anything because they've got their own populations to protect at the moment. They've got a war against a virus going on. And that's the opportunity Putin's exploiting. Yeah, we're kind of hoping this stays cold, aren't we? Because otherwise, the thought of doing something with all these other pressures on all of our countries does seem like a lot to deal with. I read some analysis in The Guardian from Andrew Roth, who's in Moscow, and he says that this is a bit different to your usual military exercises from Russia because over the last month, they've set up new field hospitals, um, long-distance shipments of armour and artillery, and they've had last-minute rail car bookings. So this feels like taking it a bit further than usual. And also Russia has more of a reason to intervene in Ukraine than it did in 2014 because they have um, people with Russian passports who consider themselves Russian, like many more than they did in 2014 and so they have to protect them and protect these people who have Russian passports so it does feel like an escalation from 2014 but having said that nothing's actually happened it's more that we're all sitting on on the cliff edge waiting for it to happen and hoping it doesn't. I mean I suppose to be fair to Russia uh, Joe on that final point of people now having Russian passports and obviously lots of people in Crimea identifying genuinely as Russian uh, Russia is entitled to deploy its forces as it sees fit with its within its own territory anywhere it likes, isn't it? It'd be bizarre to say otherwise. I mean, it is, but whether or not it's a, a diplomatically smart thing to do, I think is a slightly separate point. Um, I think that the, the thing to keep an eye on here is, is, I think, whether or not Russia chooses to de-escalate in terms of removing military presence from the border. We know that their sort of hybrid warfare, what they call their sort of blending of special forces and cyber warfare and propaganda, is always running in overdrive. And we don't actually know the extent to which in 2014 that was also deployed, as well as the little green men that Tom mentioned earlier. NATO and the US have been spending quite a lot of money on defence capabilities for Ukraine. And and when the war broke out in 2014, Ukrainian soldiers were, you know, fighting in in trainers and donated flat jackets and this kind of thing. They are now a sort of battle hardened and better equipped military. So it may well be less in Russia's interests to go and um, to go and poke that particular bear quite so much. And according to the Russians, the Ukrainians are building up troops on their side of the border as well. They are correct. Um, And that is kind of where the slightly nervous the nervous weight comes from from this story in the sense that it doesn't take a lot to escalate a situation like that when you have a build-up of troops on both sides of the border. Whether or not this was a test for Biden, I suppose, remains to be seen, but it will be interesting to see whether anything comes of his calls for a presidential summit. Um, Russia has also warned Washington away from Crimea um, because US warships were due to arrive in the Black Sea later this week. But this really is another one of those conflicts much like Nagorno-Karabakh last year um, when Russia also deployed troops and became involved. Another of your greatest hits, Joe. Another of my... Thank you very much. 
um, where you have this sort of very delicate balance of various different geopolitical aims. Um, and that's what kind of makes this quite frightening is that it could very quickly spiral and, and drag in quite a lot of people with interests in the region. OK, let's have some light relief. Uh, Tom, you have an incredibly silly story for us next after this. All right, Tom, you are finishing the show. What do you think this week should be remembered for? Life's a bitch when Facebook bans you. Uh, all right, controversy in France. A town, Dina, called Ville de Biche okay. has finally gotten some justice. Now, Biche is spelled B-I-T-C-H-E. Keep okay. that in mind. Okay. Facebook took down the town's page because it contained, quote, vulgarity. Oh, really? Ville de Biche had vulgarity, according to Facebook. The mayor said in a statement, quote, what has happened to the town of Beach demonstrates the insufficient and limited moderating tools that only the human gaze can appreciate, end quote. Breakfast television Toronto covering the uh, digital debacle that has beset Ville de Beach. Uh, Tom, to clarify, what is the name of the town? How is it spelt? What's the issue? So there's a, there's a town in the northeast of France called Ville de Beach. And the um, Biche is spelled um, B-I-T-C-H-E. And Facebook um, temporarily removed the town's Facebook page because it considered it um, offensive. So it was an algorithmical error. It was AI seeing the word bitch where there wasn't the word bitch, right? Like they could easily have stumbled across Scunthorpe. So (laughs) why is this your story of the week? I mean, errors happen, don't they, in automation? Yeah, it's... it's, um, it's, it's, it's my story of the week because I think um, there are many towns and many um, cities and villages around the world with rude names or potentially rude names. And it's just whether they should change their names to adapt to respectability or they should retain their names. So last year, in fact, um, there was a village in Austria um, that changed its name from F-U-C-K-I-N-G to Fuggin. Just to, I mean, I don't mean to make you any more blushed than you are, but I'm just, what, how do you, um, how do you pronounce F-U-C-K-I-N-G in Austria? Fucking. You do say it fucking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that was the name of their town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, an, and funnily enough, interesting enough, I should, I should specify that the town is, uh, has had that name since the 11th century, which is quite remarkable because the F word um, has only been in use in, um, in, in English since about the 15th century. Was it named after, I mean, we're going down a tangent now, but wh- why was it called that? Do you know? Um, um, right. th- there, was, there was a person um, in, in uh-huh. Austria called um, Foco, um, so F-O-C-K-O, um, and I think that the, ta- the village was named after that person. Like Andrew's Knob in Cheshire, Sir Chandrake. <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> that's, uh, that's the best question I've been asked this week. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you want to specify which Andrew? No. Um, what what I love about this, I mean, I love everything about the story, but um, what I like is how the mayor really jumps on this opportunity. Yeah. And he says, oh, <laughs> yeah, like he's having so much fun. And he's inviting um, Facebook chief executive Mark Zuckerberg, a man with plenty of time in his hands, to visit Ville de Biche and discover a pretty fortified town. So this is a bit like the Streisand effect, but kind of good. So the Streisand effect is when a celebrity has something they actually want to keep private but they they go into litigation and so it amplifies this thing they wanted to keep private yeah so she wanted to hide her malibu beach home or something didn't she from google maps was the story yeah and now we're all going this summer so like everyone knows (laughs) about it Um, and so in in a sense this is like a positive strides and effects where i'd never heard of ville de beach and i Mm. did mention before we started recording if my 15 year old self had heard of ville de beach it would have become my go-to insult for everything the whole time so in a sense like it's brought fame to them and also the village the Austrian village of fucking they they had a lot of tourism off the back of their name and that tourism has come with pros and cons on the one hand people money using their services going to restaurants paying to stay in hotels that's great but on the other hand people have been stealing the sign they've had to have anti-climb concrete put up there they've had to put money into protecting this sign and you just think with the really serious stories we've talked about in the first two-thirds of this podcast it just seems so ridiculous that a village has to spend money on uh, keeping its ridiculous name safe. But also this is about English language dominance, which is unfair. Yeah, there is an element of that, isn't there, Tom? 
Yeah, it, it, yeah, it definitely, definitely is. It, it is about. Um, I mean, why should why should Bollock in the Philippines be embarrassed that they're yeah. Bollock when it doesn't mean anything there? <laughs> yeah, I, and there is, and I was checking that there is a place in in Turkey um, that's spelled um, C U N T. I won't ask you to pronounce that one. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a bit too far. <laughs> and yeah, and, and it's and it's only offensive um, from the perspective of of somebody who has knowledge of English, uh, basically. You know what's ruined it all, Joe. Instagram. That's who to blame, isn't it? I mean, you know, they've invited Mark Zuckerberg because of Facebook, but actually it's Instagram that's the problem, isn't it? It's all these hipsters going along and taking pictures of themselves in front of the sign that says, come bum India, because they think it's funny. I mean, that used to be a personal pleasure, didn't it, when you were on a road trip? But now people are making the trip specifically to share it with thousands of people. They've ruined every holiday in Ballplay, Tennessee. I'm not, yeah, maybe. Although I'm not sure that hipsters have necessarily de- descended on Shitterton in Dorset just yet. Um, I do wonder with this story, actually, whether there's a degree of sort of nominative determinism about this as well. I've always been slightly sceptical of this this concept in relation to people. But I do wonder whether you were sort of, you know, if you were the hippest new tech startup, would you be looking to set up in Cockermouth in Cumbria, for example? Or would you want your office to be on Butthole Road in Yorkshire? And I do wonder whether these slightly unfortunate, ludicrous names do sort of mean that the town itself or the city itself can't attract the, the kind of business, the kind of the kind of people you would want investing in the area because because they're not very hip sounding places to be involved with. Do you think, Tom, our relationship with technology has an impact here? Um, because in the future, this is going to happen so much, isn't it, as things are increasingly automated, that we might just learn to dismiss this kind of thing. Like, of course, a town that looks like bitch would get taken off Facebook for a few days, but that's the kind of thing that happens. It won't be novel anymore. Or do you think the tech will improve? Hopefully it, it, it will improve, because I, I think the mayor of, of Ville de Biche did sound genuinely offended by it, because he said um, in a statement, the name of our town seemed to suffer from a bad interpretation so, so um, hopefully, as, as algorithm, algorithms become more sophisticated, they would find a way to, to adjust and account for the fact that, that these kinds of um, discrepancies and anomalies do happen, and we shouldn't just, just um, strictly um, or exclusively focus on terms and conditions. So, Chandrika, you are allowed to laugh. It looks like you're really holding it in, like you're at a funeral. <laughs> it's fine. It's a funny story. Do you have anything else to add? <laughs> Shepherd's Bush is on that map, which isn't that isn't dodgy to me, but clearly it is to other people. You should clarify. What map are you looking at? There's a we've all discovered oh. an internet resource, haven't we? That's fun. Oh, I say we all discovered <laughs> a man named Ollie Man drawing drew my attention to the vaguely rude places map, and it is Never really fun, and um, I've been enjoying it greatly. Uh, there are some ridiculous names out there. But there you are. You see, Shepherd's Bush is probably funny to an American, isn't it? It's not funny to someone from Britain because we're so used to it as terminology because it's a, a big part of London. But it's funny if you've never heard of it before. A bit like when you first see any of those words written with C-O-C-K in that's pronounced co, you know, in the Irish way. It's, it's not funny when you know it's Coburn. It's funny when you think it's Cockburn, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that maybe that's what the, that's the lesson to learn from this. As Tom said, the mayor of Wildebisch is very offended that Facebook would find anything funny or anything to ridicule about about the lovely town that he is the mayor of. And so maybe maybe residents of these places need to rise up and fight back against this. Like, for example, in 2010, uh, the residents of Castleford in Yorkshire um, were very angry when there was a petition launched to rename their landmark bridge, which is called Ticklecock. Um, and they were, <laughs> they were not having any of it. They would not agree for it to be changed to Tittlecott, which was apparently slightly more modest. And so they, they stood up and fought back. And I think mate, these people should be proud of the places they come from and, um, and not, not allow the prudes to tell them they can't call their, call their landmarks what they want to call them. Good. I think that might be a record for the amount of expletives in one episode. I actually had a point that um, living on a road with the name Butt in it, B-U-T-T, increases property values by £30,000 on average. That's fascinating. Because you would have thought the opposite, wouldn't you? You really would. T- I, I would think twice, genuinely, however lovely the house was, if I lived in a derogatory sounding road, I would think twice because I'd worry about the property value. It wouldn't bother me personally. So number one is but, that increases your property value by 30k. Coming in second is Bush in the road name. That's mentioned 79 times across England, Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland. And then third is Beaver, which is found in 57 roads in the UK. And all three of those can add, add to your house price. So the but is found in 151 different road names. 
So could be a plus. Right. Well, uh, Tom, it's a, obviously entirely insignificant the story, but thank you for making me smile. Uh, <laughs> my thanks to Tom and Joe and Sir Chandrika uh, for all of their stories. Remember, you can subscribe to this show for free. Just search for The Week Unwrapped wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, I've been Ollie Mann. You can find me at Ticklecock Bridge. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer, Sophie King at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye. <laughs>